introduce our speaker today, a very strange Dr. James Crabb, who is here in the parliament. Known to many of you because he's had a very long association with the college here. He uh, was a governing body fellow of Wilson College, and he's carried out more jobs than I can tell you about, and really he's like wine steward and various other things for the college. I know that many of you know him quite well. His interests are very wide ranging, they include climate change, evolution and adaptation coral reefs, economics, and policy development in China. He's emeritus professor from the University of Reading, was a professor of biochem at the University of Bedfordshire. And honestly, his CV is so long, I've, I've had to cut this down quite considerably, and you probably know this, but I'll just remind you of some of these things. He's a consultant on red listing to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. He's got honorary professorships at several universities in China, and he's very active in So, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Lovely. Okay, well, that's the most important thing. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, can we attain the UN Sustainable Development Goals? And I think you already know the answer. But uh, let's keep the uh, interest going. First thing I'd like to say is uh, that we live on planet Ocean. Let's forget the Earth, there are bits of Earth around. Uh, but really, the ocean and its ecosystems are absolutely critical to the survival of all species on the planet, including us. So the UN uh, decided to develop uh, sustainable development goals uh, by 2030, uh, and just some of them I'm going to talk about. And really, the main message is how we can collaborate uh, the different sustainable uh, development goals together uh, to get some sort of traction on uh, inequality, poverty, all those basic uh, elements of life. I'm very interested in how organisms adapt and evolve in extreme environments. And what we're going through at the moment is uh, the, the generation of extreme environments. And uh, we published a paper uh, way back in 2009 showing that cooperativity in regulation is absolutely critical. So uh, we worked on how photosynthetic metabolism of a particular types of plants, C3 plants, very, very common, uh, shows highly cooperative regulation under changing environments, um, particularly under water stress and high CO2 conditions. Those are the major conditions which plants are uh, uh, experiencing, um, particularly in uh, very challenging environments. More recently, uh, I've been working with uh, colleagues, particularly in Kunming, um, on the effect of drought. Uh, and we've shown that modulation of osmotic potential uh, is very important. And one, one theme, if you like, for, for most of my research, right from the very beginning uh, almost, is oxidative damage. It's how free radicals, these very reactive free radicals, superoxide radicals, hydroxyl radicals, can really be very, very dangerous um, 
we used to think they were very, going to be very difficult to measure. We've now changed that. We now understand that free radicals and our own response to free radicals is one of the major control regulations for many diseases. And I'm going to mention that a bit later. In, uh, in plants, uh, particularly, you get these peroxidases, superoxide dismutase, which uh, manage to get rid of these very reactive superoxide radicals, is very important and rises uh, in plant tissues uh, as you increase drought. Also very important is a particular signalling. We, we had a talk uh, some months ago from the man who won the Nobel Prize for signaling. Uh, signaling is absolutely vital in the way that cells talk to each other, uh, and this particular uh, molecule, abscisic acid, is very important in controlling the plant's response to drought. Now, genes, of course, you know DNA and, and you know the four bases, but it's not the only way of transmitting genetic information. So uh, what happens is that the environment can also modify the transmission of genetic information. And that occurs usually through what we call DNA methylation. And you can see, um, I don't know if I can, uh, oh yes, there we are. So here we are, particularly on the cytosine, uh, we get a methyl group, a CH3 uh, group, uh, a methyl group, and that changes the way that genetic information can be regulated. So it's a heritable epigenetic, that means it's, it's outside the normal uh, transfer of uh, DNA to RNA to protein, uh, which involves covalent transfer of a methyl group to the C5 position of the cytosine. And in plants, uh, you can have it in various ways, and that uh, influences the ways that genetic information can be controlled. And what we showed, uh, I'm just showing you here some of the, uh, the genes that are important. Uh, here we have uh, abscisic acid signaling. Photosynthesis, interestingly, in drought, is almost switched off. So uh, you get uh, the induction of super response genes there. Uh, uh, changes in the transcription factors, and particularly uh, uh, reactive ox oxygen species, or ROS, scavengers are activated. So we know that these very reactive uh, superoxide hydroxyl radicals can themselves initiate systems within the cell to try and uh, uh, ameliorate the, uh, the condition. We know that a warmer global climate can cause mutations and have more severe consequences for health. And I've been working with colleagues at Tonji University in uh, Shanghai to develop tools uh, for giving people a much better way to understand how genes work together to cause diseases. So we've developed this particular text mining tool and search engine. It is, if you like, a type of uh, AI. Uh, it's freely available. Uh, the uh, software is available here uh, for people to look at. Uh, here's the paper, which came out earlier this year. And um, what we do is use what's called natural language processing uh, to uh, develop how mutations uh, can influence disease. We then went on to look at something which is very important in cancer, which is tumor mutational burden, and showed that differentially expressed genes, uh, you could isolate and identify genes which were involved in particular uh, cancers. So that, I think, is also very exciting. But perhaps most exciting, certainly to me, is uh, something else we've just developed, which has actually only been published uh, a, a week or so ago uh, in um, iScience, which is a very general um, uh, journal, a bit like Nature, if you like, or Nature Communications, uh, to bring together um, language processing with uh, genetic databases to identify uh, genes uh, which are involved in diseases. Very few diseases are, are single gene 
mutations. So what we have done is work to uh, look at what's called gene ontology, in other words, the ways that genes can work together uh, to improve gene functional explication and prediction. So I think that's something that I hope will be very exciting. But genetics is not the only problem. Public health is absolutely crucial in trying to get better the, the overall uh, health of uh, nations and the health of both, uh, particularly of people who are, are disadvantaged. This is some work I've been doing with another group at uh, Fudan University in Shanghai, uh, where the pesticide fipronil uh, is unfortunately still used in some parts of the world. And it, in a place called the Huang River Basin, which is a very rural, poor area of China uh, to the northwest of Shanghai. We've been working on that for many years. Um, uh, exposure to this um, pesticide, which is still there from drinking water, uh, is uh, affecting the thyroid um, of many people. Uh, and so we, we published that again uh, just earlier this year in one of the uh, environmental science and technology journals from the States. So it shows that public health, the way we, we use our uh, processing are to produce drinking water, swimming pools, all the things where water is very important. Uh, even, I, I haven't time to talk about this, but we've also shown that actually processing the water itself can be harmful. So you've got to be very careful and you've got to be very vigilant um, and I'm sure you saw this morning uh, that a lot of sewage has been pumped into, uh, into uh, rivers uh, and, uh, of course, the ocean uh, around Tem Thames Water was one of the ones uh, that was implicated in that. Uh, so we, it's not just in rural China, it's everywhere that we need to be very vigilant to monitor these particular pesticides, these particular agents, uh, and make sure that the legal system and its enforcement uh, goes hand in hand. Now, I said that uh, we live on planet Ocean, and last year I was very fortunate to be invited to uh, attend and uh, work on a session, produce a session, at the United Nations Ocean Conference in Lisbon, uh, which was opened by Gutierrez, the Secretary General, uh, and it was actually run by the presidents of Portugal and Kenya. And I'm a, a senior advisor to the China Biodiversity and Green Development Foundation, a very, very large NGO uh, in China that does some very good work, not just in um, individual species, but actually works with communities too. And what we did was looking at how uh, we could promote, how the world could promote synergies between the sustainable, some of the sustainable development goals. Uh, so I was running the session with uh, a wonderful man called Fred de Bee, who was a former uh, De Deputy Secretary General of the UN, uh, Kofi An one of Kofi Annan's right-hand men. Um, and to cut a long story short, uh, we actually then um, worked with uh, social media, and uh, I was told that in the four days of our five-day meeting, we had over three million people who'd actually interacted with, with what we were doing that week. So it just shows the power uh, of, first of all, these conferences, and secondly, the importance of uh, social media in getting the message across. If we're looking at climate change, the most impacted uh, by global warming is warm water corals. Even more than seagrass meadows uh, and salt marshes, cold water corals and mangrove forests. So it's the warm water corals that are the, the most at risk. And we need those corals. Um, and uh, here's a, a, a diagram of some work that I and many others have been doing um, on uh, coral reef stress from 2014 to 17. And 
you just get the red picture, or indeed the black picture, where there was enormous bleaching, that is where the corals lose their zooxanthellae, their, their um, little algal cells which contain all the pigments which allows photosynthesis, uh, and therefore the energy to corals. Those are expelled when the temperature rises and the coral just looks white. Uh, and so there's been significant bleaching over those, uh, over those years throughout all the coral reef areas. Um, we, and there's a lot of us involved, uh, analyzed over 15,000 reef surveys at that time and showed that 80% of surveyed reef experienced significant coral bleaching and also 35% significant coral mortality. Um, that's uh, under revision at the moment with, with, with nature. So it's a real problem because uh, if we look at the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, they are a very important body for what's called red listing. And this is a process by which the extinction risk of every species on the planet is investigated. So whether you're a mosquito, whether you're an elephant, whether you're a coral, uh, whether you're a nudibranch, so those are those lovely little uh, coloured uh, invertebrates that live, in, uh, live on coral reef ecosystems, uh, you have to go through the same highly rigorous process. Uh, and I've been involved with that for, for quite a few years. But you can see in previous red listing that the most at risk were corals. So the uh, fall uh, in, um, in the uh, 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 mitigation uh, was considerably lowered uh, from 2000 to 2008. And I can tell you uh, it's getting worse. Uh, just to show you some pictures of corals, these are corals from the Caribbean. I've done lots of work with uh, Jamaica in particular. I went there every year from 2000 to 2015 working on coral reefs. And here we have some corals from the Indo-Pacific. And I've done lots of work in Indonesia, which is part of what's called the Coral Triangle, uh, where there are more coral species than anywhere else on the planet. Um, so this is what red listing does. Uh, these are the categories. And the worst category, of course, is extinct. Uh, but the threatened category is the worst is critically endangered. Uh, so we go from where there's not enough data, uh, through least concern, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered for extinction risk. Um, we have already done uh, all 85 Atlantic species of corals, uh, and uh, that I, that's just to show you the enormity of the work and the data that I and others are involved in. And we're currently working on 791 species of Indo-Pacific corals. It's, uh, it's a significant piece of work. So, actually look at policy changes. And here we have the sort of things that uh, red listing uh, can, uh, can help with. Uh, it can help with assessment laws, regulation, disease control policies, uh, agriculture uh, and forestry, air quality standards, soil recovery plans. These are the sort of policy changes that the IUCN red listing has actually uh, done and changed. Uh, so it's, it's really exciting that when we finish the, the whole picture of corals, then I think we can, we can work hard on trying to work with other organizations, uh, other NGOs, non-governmental non organizations, in order to change, to change policy. Now, I mentioned on my first slide uh, that I was involved in DESK. Uh, DESK is uh, the uh, Digital Environment System Coalition that is run out of the office of the UNESCO Chair 
in ICT for Development. And the holder of that chair uh, is uh, a friend uh, um, uh, and uh, a professor, of course, uh, like me. He's a, an emeritus professor. He's a geographer. Uh, and also, like me, he's worked on wine, uh, uh, a great man called uh, Tim Unwin. And uh, he and others are involved in DESK. And the point about this is that it's a holistic approach to the interrelationships between digital technologies and the physical environments. So the emphasis is on not just the positive benefits that technology, AI, etc., can bring, but also the negative harms that result from the use of digital technologies. So it looks at the high, the entire systems biology, if you like, of human environment interfaces, not just on climate change and carbon. So we do research practice and policy development. And one of the things that I've been working on with DESK is looking at deep sea mining. And you may have come across this um, because it's minerals for renewable technologies and retrieving mineral deposits from the deep sea. Minerals that are very important uh, at the moment using current technology in all your iPhones, your computers, uh, we need those uh, at the moment. And depleting terrestrial deposits and the rising demand for metals are stimulating interest in the deep sea with commercial mining imminent. Uh, I don't have time to, to go into this in too much detail, but you can see the major, whoops, uh, I'll just go back one, the major area is in what's called Clarion Clipperton zone uh, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and the question is, uh, the big question is, can we get enough information about deep sea ecosystems before the big companies come in and destroy them? So uh, deep sea mining uh, particularly uh, is, has been involved with uh, polymetallic, polymetallic nodules. There's, there's one of them there. Unfortunately, they are very um, important for the deep sea ecosystems. Um, and the uh, machinery, as you can see, is not small to get these things. And uh, lots of impacts, uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, plumes, uh, which can influence uh, many, many ecosystems, particularly in the deep ocean. So what is in the deep ocean? They cover more than half of Earth's surface. You may remember I said that we actually lived on, on planet ocean. And they remain one of the least explored ecosystems on the planet. I'm sure you know that we know more about the moon than about the, the, deep, uh, the deep ocean. Uh, they are absolutely vital in nutrient recycling for the healthy functioning of ocean ecosystems and carbon sequestration for the regulation of Earth's quiet climate over geological timescales. Uh, and they're much more diverse than the oceanic waters above them. Um, so we need to have concerted international efforts to understand their own biodiversity and its ecological role. Uh, there are some of the creatures that have been found, uh, quite large and quite small. Um, almost all of them were previously unknown. This is a, a very important paper, and I only want to, to show you, uh, this is the deep, uh, so this is benthic, that means on the bottom of, of, of the ocean, here we have pelagic, which means going right across the, the ocean uh, 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 from uh, one end to the other. Um, and you can see the key element here is that the majority of species are unassigned. We just do not know. And the danger is that we're just going to destroy the environment uh, before we understand, uh, A, how important it is, and B, what is actually there. Uh, we get a lot of sediment and noise from this mining. Um, that influences um, normally quiet uh, environments, and it affects deep-sea fish species, their reproduction, as well as marine mammals.
If I can ask you, I'm particularly interested in your working with China and your research there. Because, of course, here, we're very ignorant. We believe really what's in the news and we just think, you know, China's some big bad monster that sells us lots of horrible plastic. And, you know, TikTok and all of this stuff, it's about all we know about it. And yet there you are, really working away. I wonder, firstly, could you give us a sort of your personal impression of whether you think the authorities in China are really keen to seriously get to grips with this? Is it, is it going in the right direction <coughs> on the one hand? And also, given the things that we know about these days to do with information security, are you aware, does it give you any sort of limits to the degree of cooperation that you can give? Okay. Very good question, of course. Um, a few years ago, well, actually, two years ago, uh, I published uh, a, a very short article in China Daily on uh, the environment with, with one of my Chinese collaborators. Um, and the, the first thing to say is, if you work with China, you can't tell them what to do. You have to understand something about the culture, the history, uh, the way they think, uh, and that's what I spend quite a bit of my time doing outside the research. Otherwise, it's just not possible. So trying to understand the Chinese mind, which is, let me tell you, extremely difficult, but at least I have a little, tiny bit of understanding, and that's been enormously helpful in, in some of the, uh, the collaborations that I, that I do. Secondly, um, in order to understand China, you, you, just to give you a little example, when somebody from China is working with you on a project and they say, this is a win-win situation, what they mean is, we are winning and we couldn't care less about you. It doesn't mean that we, de we want to destroy you. It doesn't mean that, that, that we want you, know, you to fail. But it means that our priority is with our own nation. And you can see that in all the, all the output that, that, that they produce. And that's fine, because you can work with that. Um, so it's not, it's not a, a negative point. It's just a flat liner, which you, which you have to understand. Uh, there's a very good um, book, well, very good article, uh, put out by the China version, the China uh, section of the Club of Rome. Club of Rome, uh, you may know, produced a, a seminal book uh, in 1972 called Limits to Growth. And uh, what this uh, article is that I'm referring to uh, was produced last year on, you know, why bother to understand China? Uh, and it's very good. It, 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 exemplifies many of the things that, that I work with in China. The problems, of course there are problems. They're not problems of limiting what we do. I have never found that in any research because, of course, the research that we're doing is vital for everybody. You know, and, th and that's the key point. Um, I mean, often we use uh, places in China as a model, for example, the Huai River Basin, or particular Chinese databases, if we're looking at economics, how different provinces uh, can enhance their own environmental performance, how the production of um, incentives to businesses has improved uh, the, uh, the pollution uh, in particular parts of China. I've, I've published on those before. So th things can happen. So you could use China as a, as a model. And as I said right at the beginning, um, you know, the, the pollution that we have here, you know, is at least, uh, you know, we are not perfect. Um, and we need to work with, with all these countries uh, in order to, to, uh, to improve our systems. So just to summarize, yes, of course there are challenges. Uh, I don't speak Mandarin, which is unfortunate. Uh, but I do lots of things, but I'm afraid languages are not, uh, are not one of them. So uh, I, I rely on wonderful translators. And also when the Chinese think they speak English, sometimes that's a bit difficult. And in the same way, you're not aware then of any pressures coming from this side, people saying to you, that's all been well, but you really can't be sharing that with them. Okay. I don't do that sort of work. You, I'm sure you've read 
um, certainly last year, there was like a witch hunt in America uh, against academics who worked with China at a high level. And that particularly impacted on key scientists who had laboratories and who worked uh, very closely and lived in China for part of the time. Um, the, only, the only problem that I think arose out of all that uh, was somebody from Harvard who failed to declare his income for tax purposes. Uh, so I think he's in prison now. So uh, the issue was, was one of withholding tax information to the country. It wasn't of information that was exchanged. That's not to say that you know, both countries, or all countries, use their own ways of, of gaining information in all sorts of ways. Uh, as a JP, I, I remember going to a very interesting uh, lecture by um, a police body that uh, looked at um, how uh, hackers, uh, where hackers were coming from uh, in throughout the world, and uh, certainly China and Russia were very high on the list. So you've got to recognize these things, of course. Um, I mean, I, I recognize that when I, when I uh, go on WeChat and I collaborate with my, I, I communicate with my colleagues, then you know, it's probably known throughout the Chinese Communist Party if they choose to actually look at it. But that doesn't worry me because I don't, I don't work in that way. You know, these are, these are important scientific criteria. They're not changing the way that AI will, will develop uh, because the sort of information technology that we use is solely for health purposes. Uh, so it's not, it's not at that level, if you like. Uh, I like one of the phrases in one of your slides. I liked a lot of what you did, everything, but uh, ecosystem services. Um, and it seems to me when you're talking about the ocean, you, you're mentioning, first of all, a lot of different ecosystems, even though we might think of it as one. Just, for example, the deep sea one you mentioned and then the coral reef one. And you've also pointed out that these systems are interdependent. And you've also pointed out human agency is the critical thing, that we're causing these issues, and it's a... A feedback loop that we're suffering from from our actions um, but immediately it seems like an incredibly interdependent complex system and there was three things that seemed to spring to mind as quite problematic I'd like your thoughts on one was with all these ecosystems like the deep sea and, and mining it there are benefits from that presumably but you're saying there's a lot that we don't know so the first <coughs> thing is this problem of uncertainty how do we how do we approach an ecosystem that we don't know how it works, but recognizing that we'll never know perfectly how it works, and yet we've got people who need to survive and live and may die if they don't have the service <laughs> that it offers. So how do we deal with that uncertainty? Is there a point at which you say, well, there's, there's too much uncertainty, or we just gotta live with the uncertainty? Um, so that gets us into a category then of things that we can take action on and things that we just don't know. <laughs> but then how do you prioritise even in the area where we've got some level of certainty um, when these systems are so interdependent? And if, I don't know if you must have thought about this more than I have in the ocean, so I'd just get your response on those two thoughts about uncertainty and prioritisation of decision making. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, you have to get people to the table to talk about it. And secondly, you have to get them to care. I mean, if, if the, your perception of these mining companies is that they, they are there uh, to produce benefits, as you can see that I, that I mentioned, um, the question is the trade-off with the ecosystem. But I'd like to think as in medicine, these things are evidence-based. When we don't have evidence, it becomes a belief system. As soon as you get into a belief system, 
the whole thing collapses. It goes into, uh, if you like, an I Ching type of approach. Uh, that's a, a particular uh, Taoist philosophy in China. Um, so it, it is a totally different thing if you go for a belief system. And I think you have to move from a belief system to evidence-based. For example, Liz mentioned that all she knew about China was what? What the media said. That's a belief system. Okay? There's no evidence. You know, I've at least tried to produce some evidence of some good thing. And uh, the lady at the back um, mentioned the depression. Now, some of my colleagues will say we are heading for the next mass extinction event. Human beings will be wiped out. Now, I don't say that, and the reason I don't say that is because I have evidence that you can improve things on coral reefs. I haven't gone into that, but certainly on the reefs of Jamaica, I have seen them bounce back after terrible bleaching events. Things can happen. The question is how and why, and what can we do to then introduce those techniques to other reefs in order to, to make them survive. So knowledge is absolutely crucial. Uh, and at the moment, with the deep sea ecosystems, we just don't have enough knowledge. We know what we don't know just about, but we need to know a lot more. And then we can make a, a, an evidence-based decision. And the decision may be that we mine. For example, when I dive in Jamaica, out, out, out of Discovery Bay, Discovery Bay is one of the major sources of the major uh, money spinner for Jamaica, which is bauxite. That's the ore of aluminium. Uh, they produce, along with Australia, of course, a, a tremendous amount of, of bauxite that's used in the world. There were ships that come in into Discovery Bay every week last time that I was there. Um, the reason they come in is that the company worked with the person who looked after the uh, the diving centre, the, mar the, the marine station at Discovery Bay, they asked the question, how can we get our ships in over the coral reefs to pick up the bauxite without destroying the coral reefs? And he did it. This was way back in the, in the 1960s. And it's still used today. Uh, the coral reefs are still there, I mean, um, but the, the shipping isn't the factor why the coral reefs in Jamaica are in such a bad state. That was due to all sorts of other factors. Uh, but, he, you know, it's working with the ecologists, between the organisations and the ecologists, to then develop what a, a reasonable solution, a compromise, if you like, but something which will produce benefits to both sides. for like increasing uh, like the, the coral to, to deep. Yeah. But then would you say is that is more human involvement the solution or would it be better to leave nature to nature? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, well, I haven't mentioned it, uh, but I and another uh, set of collaborators have actually used CRISPR in tomatoes to, to look at breeding um, and improve that. Um, CRISPR is a particular gene editing uh, mechanism um, uh, that, that was uh, designed a few years ago. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize, quite, quite rightly. Uh, and it's, um, it's a way of changing the gene uh, to, um, to so that the, the genetic information, the proteins, become modified so they can react in a particular way. The problem is the unforeseen consequences. So, for example, corals have lots of different, what we call clades, that's the way the genes are organized, of zooxanthellae. These are these little algal cells that live in the, in the coral. <coughs> and there's one clade that is actually very, very good at resisting higher temperatures. So you might think that, hey, let's get this clade right into all the corals. Unfortunately, there are also negative consequences of doing that. 
because generally speaking, corals have a number of different clades. And if you have all the clade, only just one to withstand high temperatures, it means the coral is much more susceptible to sedimentation. And sedimentation, you know, can often occurs and can really destroy corals. So, you know, it comes back to the knowledge. You've got to know a lot in order to, to get the balance right. There's some very good work on coral restoration at the moment being done uh, by Madeline Oppen uh, and colleagues at Ames, that's the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences for the, for the, for the Great Barrier Reef, on exactly that. Um, and let's see um, if, if that can at least produce some, some benefits. Uh, it's worth a trial, uh, and uh, that, that's what's going on now. Well, that's of course quite true. No, I didn't mention it. Uh, for well, it's it's highly evocative, and it it comes it comes perilously close to a belief system. Uh, I mean, put it this way. The Earth has a particular, the, the, the ocean uh, and the Earth has a particular carrying capacity. You know, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, biodiversity of species that, that it can cope with. Uh, if, that gets, if that gets too high, then uh, a Malthusian type of, uh, of process occurs and, and the population decreases. Um, so, uh, of course, you're right, and some people do feel that population increase is the biggest problem. Uh, I think uh, I, I'd be very, very uh, reluctant to go down that route for all sorts of reasons, not least that it's the people who are going to solve the problem. And if you limit the people, then you limit the brains, you limit the intelligence, and you know it, it, it get, becomes a sort of... Uh, more like a, a monastic type of culture. We certainly don't want that, I don't think. So, uh, of course you're right, population is the elephant in the room, if you like, but um, it's, it's not by itself, uh, I think, perhaps the major, major problem. Of course it would be wonderful if birth control was in, 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 introduced throughout. So for example, I, I used to work in Indonesia, as I said, uh, and worked with a community of people, I don't know if you've come across them, called the Bajo people. Now the Bajo people used to live on, on ships all the time uh, because they believed that bad spirits were on the land, so they never lived on, on, on land. But around the middle of the 20th century, some of them built um, houses uh, on the ocean. Unfortunately, they mined coral reefs to actually get the, get the, <laughs> get the, um, the, the, the foundations, and that has other problems, of course. Um, but I work with a, with a Bajo community very close to um, one of the marine stations that I worked on in a, a highly remote place, I and mean, that's another story, in Indonesia. Um, they were the most joyous people I have ever met. Whenever we went to visit them, the, the sheer joy and welcoming was palpable. It, it was an experience like, like no other. Um, the life expectancy uh, was about 45. Um, there was somebody in the community who had gone away to learn nursing, and she was trying to introduce birth control, but you know it was an uphill struggle. But one of the interesting things is when you went up, they, they lived in um, huts on pillars. So there was the coral for the foundation, pillars, the animals were all here, and then the, the housing was, was above. And when you went into, into their houses, they had the most advanced TV, digital TV system you have ever seen. You know, they completely bypassed the industrial yes. revolution and gone straight to the 21st century. Very fascinating. 
So again, very complex. They had their own uh, culture. Uh, and interestingly, they had no word for future. So you couldn't really say to them, you need to preserve these, these reefs and the fishing. You know, that didn't do that. Anyway, that was interesting. Professor Crabb, what an absolute mine of information. I think we need to leave this one here, but he might be around for a few more minutes if anything occurs to anybody. Thank you so much once again for this incredible, wide-ranging talk. Thank you very much.